Welcome to the Sea Trade Maritime Podcast for our latest episode of Maritime in Minutes. You are listening to Marcus Han, editor of Sea Trade Maritime News, and Gary Howard, Europe editor of Sea Trade Maritime News. Maritime in Minutes is our monthly podcast where we pick out some of the most topical news stories from around the world of maritime on Sea Trade Maritime News over the last month, and today we're covering March 2023. We have an awful lot to get through in this episode, so I'm going to get straight on and hand over to Gary for his first pick from the first week of March. Yep, I'm going to kick it off with an update on the Frontline Euronav soap opera. So spoiler warning if you're not up to date on season four of whatever we're on now. Euronav CEO Hugo de Stoop said it could take months, if not years, to settle the arbitration on the merits of whether Frontline was within its rights to unilaterally terminate the merger agreement, which happened earlier this year, the agreement signed last year. In the same call, de Stoop warned that proposals put forward by CMB to replace the entire supervisory board at Euronav was essentially an attempt by CMB to take over Euronav without paying the premium that's normally associated with a takeover. Frontline CEO had his own comment on the botched merger, saying in the Q4 2022 call for Frontline that the merger was firmly off the table. And then I'm going to jump ahead because it's on the same topic. Later in the month, Euronav had a general meeting where shareholders voted on CMB's proposal to replace the board, as well as proposals to nominate representatives from frontline-aligned Famatown. In the end, Euronav pretty much got its way. Two CMB representatives joined the board, two from Famatown, which is what Euronav wanted, but they lost two of their existing board members which they didn't want, it leaves a more balanced board rather than one just full of people that CMB wanted in there. Stay tuned for the next instalment on this one, as I'm sure there's uh, plenty more drama to come. Marcus, what's your first week pick? It's actually another merger-related story, but just sort of coming back to that with Euronav and Frontline, it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out now. I mean, that board is going to be, you know, incredibly difficult to actually make decisions given you've got two competing different sets of companies that have tried to take over Euronav with the members on the board. I'm sure Euronav wanted it that they had their five and then the other guys had their two each. Euronav only having their own three independent board members versus two each for the other guys balances things out a bit more perhaps than they wanted. No, indeed. It's been very interesting to see where where this one goes. As I said, for the first week of March, I've also gone with something that was a merger. In this case, it's one that's been also going on for quite a long time, and it was the completion of the merger of Semcorp Marine and Keppel Offshore Marine in Singapore. The merger of these two offshore yard, group, yard groups and ship repair groups had been mooted for years, and it has now finally become a reality. The process itself has taken the better part of two years to come to fruition, and even once they'd actually agreed a transaction, it was restructured so as to avoid having to avoid seeking court approvals to merge Keppel O&M into the Singapore-listed Semcorp Marine. As a result, Semcorp Marine officially acquired Keppel O&M, and the combined entity at this point in time continues to trade as Semcorp Marine. However, in many ways it would appear to be a reverse takeover, as following a share issue, Keppel shareholders own 55% of the merged company, and the CEO and Chief Operating Officer positions were both taken by senior Keppel O&M executives Chris Ong and Chaw Hao Jat. The latter should be familiar to ship repair customers at Keppel Shipyard. A review of operations is now underway, with at least five different large facilities in Singapore alone. Some kind of rationalisation should be expected. In terms of business focus, they're looking at renewables and offshore wind to play a big part in their future business. There's a lot of work to still be done on this merger, although it is at least actually finally completed after a two-year gestation period. And Gary, over to you for week two. Yeah, a bit of satellite communications for week two. A story from ship manager Anglo Eastern, who said it expects that at least 200 of its vessels will be connected to SpaceX's Starlink network by the end of 2023. I picked this out as Starlink is an LEO or low Earth orbit system, 
basically the satellites are much closer to Earth, and this helps lower the latency, the, the time it takes to send and receive data, and also the bandwidth, the, the amount of data that you can send over a given time. I won't go into the big differences between LEO and the, the types of satellites that we're used to in maritime, but suffice to say this means that ships will be more of an extension of the office in digital terms and able to send and receive large amounts of data in basically real time. We did a webinar not too long ago about LEO and its implications of maritime with Speedcast and Amazon's AWS, so we'll, we'll stick a link to that in the show notes if it's of interest. The LEO rollout is also great news for crews. I mean, hopefully, they should get better links back to shore for, for video calling and communication with friends and family. Um, it'll be interesting to see how the uptake hits the maritime industry, what we managed to drag out of this improved connectivity, but also how our industry hits LEO services, because there, there are quite a few coming online from some really big names in tech, but there's going to be a race between building up the capacity of those satellites and services and the uptake of customers taking up that capacity. So there could be bandwidth limitations and things coming into play. Marcus, your week two pick, can you bring us back down from space? Very much so, actually. It's quite a down-to-earth story about how we're going to finance the decarbonisation of the shipping industry. Our Middle East correspondent, Peter Shaw Smith, attended Marie Money in Dubai during March. Prominent lawyer, Harry Theochari, posed the question of who was actually going to finance shipping's multi-trillion dollar bill for decarbonizing its fleet in the coming decades. Somewhat predictably, the question seemed to generate as much questions itself as it did actual answers to the financing conundrum. Europe, where there has been more focus on sustainability than in some other regions, finance was seen as being available for green shipping projects. Others question the lack of common sense in not being able to finance or scrap vessels that are, say, more than 12 years old. Another believed that costs should be passed on to the consumer, something we could see in the container sector, which is also under the most pressure to decarbonize. Container lines do have a mechanism to pass that cost on, at least for fuels via the bunker adjustment factor. Overall, the question, though, would appear to have remained unanswered. In the longer term, I'd be surprised, though, if finance does not become available, despite the huge sums involved, although it may be somewhat sort of piecemeal solutions. So that's going to be a story that develops over, well, years and decades as to how we're actually going to be able to finance this whole decarbonization of the industry. But as with a lot of these things, if the need is there, somebody will move in to fill the gap, I'm sure. Yeah, and one of my picks later in the month will cover a little bit of that. But I, I actually saw Harry Theocharry in Stanford, so he gets about. Indeed. If you're enjoying the Sea Trade Maritime podcast, make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing on the app of your choice. Back in the UK for my week three pick, the UK Maritime 2050 strategy was released in 2019, and a recent report came out scrutinising that from the UK House of Commons Transport Committee. Interesting reading. Essentially, the report said the strategy was too muddled, and it wasn't clear which of the 184 items within it were recommendations, which were aspirational, and which were specific actions. The committee called for more clarity and for a streamlining of the recommendations in the strategy. They also specifically said that state funding will be necessary to take zero emissions technologies from the R&D phase throw into the market proper. Shore Power will need funding over and above the matched funding that the government has already promised, said the committee. And keep your ears peeled for, or open, or whatever you do with ears, for an upcoming podcast on UK Shore Power. I recorded it last week and it was a really interesting conversation. Back to the report, it said the government needs to move away from treating ports as Swiss army knives. Ports are being left to enforce the proposed seafarers wage bill. And the committee apparently are convinced that ports are probably better equipped to move cargo rather than police seafarer wages. Marcus, I fancy a significant data point in a clear industry trend, perhaps with some big numbers. Have you got anything that, that fits that bill? Yeah, I might just have that. Um, it wouldn't be an episode of Maritime Minutes without something on the container shipping market. So here goes for week three. New York listed Zim's annual results showed a familiar picture now of, of very healthy full year results of some $4.63 billion in 2022. 
but a sharp drop of 76% in its fourth quarter profit. Now, Zoom operates roughly 50-50 between contract and spot cargoes, and this was reflected in the severity of that profit drop in Q4 compared to, say, some of its competitors like, uh, for example, Maersk. In its earnings call, CFO and Executive Vice President Xavier Destro got quite feisty in terms of its stance on the contract rates and negotiations on the Trans-Pacific, where lines are finding themselves under heavy pressure from shippers, armed with an 80% reduction in spot rates over the last year. He said that both sides knew there was a natural equilibrium and warned that if they didn't get the rates that made sense to continue sailing, they would simply stop sailing, causing major disruption to shippers. Well, it's certainly fighting talk, but are they really willing to do this? Past experience of depressed container shipping markets says a competitor would just jump in to fill the gap, and there would be no shortage of tonnage to do this, that's for sure. More likely, it would seem another scenario which Destria set out, where Zim gambles on spot rates rising in the second half of 2023, and opts for a lower percentage of contract cargo versus spot cargo for the coming 12 months. So, yeah, again, that one's going to play out in the next couple of months, so... Do they really stick to the stance that they've set out there? Be interesting to see. Gary, moving on to week four, and you were rather busy stateside, I believe. Yeah, week four for me was a trip to Connecticut in the US for CMA Shipping 2023. I was very pleased to attend the show. Um, we all, as as in formal markets, we organised the show. Um, but I've been reading about it for about well, best part of a decade, I suppose. It was nice to put some names to the faces in the the US market and to catch up with Barry Parker, our US correspondent. Luckily, we were fed a very good conference program, which gave us plenty to write about. I really enjoyed the keynote speech by Knut Orbeck Nielsen from DNV, and it's not often that you'll hear a journo praising a sponsor's keynote, but it just seemed quite straightforward and honest really. Knut said that new fuels and their infrastructure will be late to the market and in short supply when they do arrive, which he takes as further motivation to do what we can now to cut carbon emissions rather than waiting for the the silver bullet further down the line. Energy security was also high on his agenda, which he sees as entwined with the decarbonisation drive. And there was a fair bit of time given to cybersecurity, which again, a pleasant surprise really. DNV's ship manager software was the target of a ransomware attack earlier this year. And it seems that DNV is sort of taking the high road and sharing its experiences from that rather than shying away from the matter as, as it could do. Also on that same first day of the conference was a great speech from Michael Parker at City. Always a great speaker. I really enjoy listening to him. The gist of this speech was that for banks and financiers, things are about to get more difficult when it comes to making investment decisions on green criteria in shipping. The conditions that the members of the Poseidon principles have agreed to mean that financiers will need to make tougher decisions on supporting the greenest and not supporting others, essentially. Um, And scrutiny of finance portfolios is set to increase. There's a warning straight from him. And the phenomenon is not just limited to within the maritime industry. Lots more going on at CMA. So my week five pick is also going to be a couple of stories from CMA, even though it was a three-day event that I've just told you happened in week four. Marcus, what have you got for week four? Something that happened in week four. Actually, I'm turning my attention to shipyards, and it's a story from our China correspondent, Catherine C. And it's a story that potentially is very good news for the health of shipping markets going forward. And that is that the world's top shipbuilders are basically full up for the next few years. Now, while I've seen quite a bit of anecdotal evidence from analysts on this, it has been that. It's been anecdotal. China State Shipbuilding Corporation confirmed the the situation by saying its three largest Shanghai yards, that's Hudong, Zhonghua, Waigaochou, and Jiangnan, were full into 2027. They didn't quite clarify that was the start or the end of 2027, but it was presumably somewhere into that year. And they have those three yards alone, have 183 new building orders on hand, which is a significant number when you consider they are building very large vessels. The top Chinese and South Korean yards have been filling up their order books with LNG carriers and ultra-large container ship tonnage, meaning that meaning that basically delivery slots for large technical vessels are now going to be extremely scarce. This could be particularly good news for the tanker sector. It's currently enjoying its best market in years. 
and has an order book of just 3.7% of the current fleet in tonnage terms, according to Provoker's SSY. If owners are unable to order new builds for delivery before 2027, this promises a significantly tight market in the coming years for the tanker sector. So, well, this could be some good news coming out of this. Yeah, and this will tie into one of my next stories, but Catherine sends over a lot of shipbuilding stories out of China, and every time I see the year of delivery, I sort of stop and think to myself, wait, what year is it? Oh, that's four years away that this vessel is going to hit the water. Yeah, it's very interesting when you think about that, making that investment decision as well, right? Okay, well, I'm going to invest 100 million plus um, on a vessel that I'm not going to see for four years. It's uh, you know, in markets that change rapidly. It's, uh, you know, it does make you think. I'll carry us into week five. My week five picks from the same CMA shipping that happened in week four. Firstly, a comment from Mark O'Neill at Columbia Ship Management that shipping will need fossil fuels for the foreseeable future. Mark really hammered this point home, that a sensible and intelligent conversation on the future of maritime must include fossil fuels, and that related technologies like carbon capture to minimise the, the impact of those. I was surprised to hear it, I think. Fossil fuels obviously not in vogue at the moment, but he was insistent that they're going to be around for a while. Uh, I, I asked the question to the the rest of the panel what they what they thought about that and they were they were softer a little bit sheepish perhaps i mean it wasn't even what the 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 panel was actually about and you could see that some of them didn't really want to nail their colors to the the fossil fuel mast and then finally cma shipping sort of culminates in the commodore debate um, where the cma commodores past and president talk about the market and i picked a strand I, i really enjoyed from retired tk ceo peter evanson who said the introduction of the next generation low emissions vessels will start a good fight in the industry. He foresees a future where regulators are being pressured by those who have these greenest vessels on the water and they want regulation tightened to push out the older, dirtier ships, while the older, dirtier ships play defense for as long as they can, um, telling them that the market still needs them because of, uh, because of how many of them there are. Um, I thought that was quite an interesting way of, 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 of looking at the future and quite feasible. For now, though, and this ties into what we were talking about from Catherine's story, regulatory and technological uncertainty have made ship owners disciplined, he said. Ordering vessels is what ruins markets, and nobody is ordering anything as they don't know what to order. Plenty more good stories from CMA shipping on Sea Trade Maritime News. Check out the event section along the top navigation bar, and you'll, you'll find them all in there. There's some great stuff from, from Barry as well. And Marcus, I'll leave you to, to see us out. Right. Um, so coming right to the end of March, I'm going to talk about a story I happened on the last day of the month due to the fact that I was traveling at the point it happened when we actually published um, the story in early April. But um, anyway, it involves a long-running saga between the European Commission and the Philippines over the standards of training and certification of its seafarers. Now, when I say long-running, this is an issue that's been ongoing since 2006, with a potential ban on Filipino officers serving on European-flagged ships has kind of hung over the nation's seafarers since the late, sort of, the late noughties. Fast forward to December 2021, and the threat to no longer recognize Philippines-issued seafarer certificates, including SGCW, sounded as serious as probably it ever had done. Um, it was enough to get Philippines President Ferdinand R. Marcos Jr. to step in, meeting with government and industry officials in Europe, on top of that, there were a raft of corrective actions um, put, put, pushed out by the Philippines government, and they appear to have done the trick. The result is that on March the 31st, the European Commission announced it would continue to recognize seafarer certificates issued by the Philippines, noting the efforts the country had made, and also offering technical support for further improvements. The move is clearly good news for all sides. It's good news for ship owners, so there's some 50,000 Filipino seafarers working on EU flagged ships, and the Philippines' huge crewing industry. The decision was welcomed by industry bodies such as the International Chamber of Shipping and the European Community Ship Owners Association. Hopefully, it will now allow ship owners, seafarers, and the Philippines' crewing industry to move forward with more confidence. 
And that brings us to the end of this episode of Maritime in Minutes. If you want to know more, as with all the other stories mentioned in this podcast, the links are in the show notes, or just head over to seatrade-maritime.com to read these and all the latest maritime news. And that's all we have time for on this episode of Maritime in Minutes. Thank you for listening, and make sure you subscribe on the app of your choice to never miss an episode. Until the next episode of the Sea Trade Maritime Podcast, stay safe. <laughs>